So with all that said, I'd love to ask this stupid old bastard exactly which of the more than 2,000 species of extant termites he thinks these invisible fossils are just like. That comment alone speaks volumes about the childish and simplistic mind that we're dealing with here. And now let's get back to the question of why Farmer Taylor is so insistent on misrepresenting the physical evidence. So now that he's fired up his John Deere, let's take a look at what he's planning to do with it. That there is no evidence of any termite evolution in this nest agrees perfectly with the Bible's claim that all things reproduce after their kind. And there we have it. With this devious sleight of hand, the creatard claims that these ancient termites that weren't actually in the fossil, that produced similar fecal pellets and that behaved in a similar manner, are in fact the same as termites that are alive today and so evolution must not occur. One can only wonder whether he read the same paper I did, or whether he read it at all. And so a 65 million year old fossil that was found in a late Cretaceous formation and in itself conclusively negates biblical creation and a young earth is, with a generous dollop of dishonesty, a liberal sprinkling of sophistry and a side dish of reprehensible lies served up as proof positive for the Abrahamic creation myth. And here I've been for the past year arguing that there's no such thing as magic. Of course, there's nothing new here, just a rehashing of the same dismal failed arguments we've heard time and time again with organisms such as crinoids, various mollusks, shrimp, plants, and of course, coelacanths, otherwise colloquially known as living fossils. All your deceptive little muckrakers done is substitute the word termite as an excuse to spew out the same old pathetically unconvincing bullshit. This argument, of course, completely ignores the well-documented concept of evolutionary stasis. It's been clearly understood for decades that evolutionary lineages can and do remain relatively stable morphologically over periods of millions of years in the absence of dramatic changes in selective pressures. This stasis is maintained at least in part by the statistical stabilization of gene pools in large populations by allele dilution and gene flow, although the exact contributions of these and other factors are the subject of active debate and research by today's evolutionary biologists. Thus, given a sufficiently large breeding population and a sufficiently stable environment, evolutionary theory easily accounts for phenotypic persistence, be it in snails or shrimp or fish or termites. However, over longer periods of time, even this persistence of phenotypes begins to apply only to gross morphology. Zoologists and paleontologists with the appropriate training and experience are able to easily distinguish similar species within the fossil record and to differentiate extant species from their extinct relatives, even creating mathematical algorithms to quantify these differences. Of course, none of this matters to the fatuous creatards who try to propound this stunted and sickly runt of an argument in its many forms. The fact that this concept has been explained countless times does nothing to prevent them from gleefully interpreting stasis as an absence of any evolutionary process at all, presumably by conceitedly using a maxim along the lines of, it looks the same to my ignorant and untrained eye, so it is the same. By way of an example, let me quote from a random paper I selected on trilobite morphology that demonstrates the detail and precision used by a trained professional. Granulation is coarsest on the posterior half of the axial rings, on the glabella and cheeks, and on the pleural ribs of the thorax and pygidium. Furrows are finely granulated to smooth. In contrast, the creationists who make these arguments about living fossils essentially simply just assert the lack of any evolutionary change with no evidence or argument and no reference to any specific specimens or morphological features. Essentially, the best they can do is, Sure looks the same, don't it? <laughs> That might impress you, BB, but it elicits an entirely different response from anyone who can tell the difference between a laboratory and a lobotomy. Now, before I wrap up this section, let's get back to the subject of termites so I can show you what a little real research can do. Based on morphological analyses of extant species and on the fossil record, it's been long accepted that termites and cockroaches are descended from a common roach-like ancestor. Unsurprisingly, more recent DNA analysis has confirmed this to be the case, providing three independent verifications of the evolutionary relationships of these insects. Additionally, Mastotermes darwiniensis, the most roach-like of the termites, is the only one that carries an endosymbiotic bacterium that's common to all cockroaches. Researchers predicted that these bladder bacteria should have co-evolved with their hosts and recently conducted a molecular analysis of a number of roaches and this termite and their respective microbial symbionts. 
The resulting phylogenies of both insects and bacteria were almost identical and provided a breathtaking validation of evolutionary theory, for only evolution both predicted and provides an explanation for the convergence of these cladograms. This is just one example of the countless equally impressive pieces of evidence that all converge inexorably to the same conclusion. The evolution is a fact that is beautifully explained by the theory of the same name regardless of what cretins like Ian Taylor have to say about it. And if he doesn't like it, then he can stick it up his compost heap.